Hello, everyone. Um, the people are still registering. We are filling up the numbers. So we'll wait for another minute and then we'll start right away. Okay, I would say let's start. Good afternoon, and uh, depending on your time zone, good evening and good morning, and welcome to the first joint webinar of the Federation of European Neuroscience Societies, so FENS, and of the uh, European Psychiatric Association, the EPA. So a webinar that is a product of this uh, newly formed collaboration between FENS and EPA. And we'll, we'll be uh, hopefully the kickoff of a very successful series of webinars. So I'm Dirk Schubert, and on behalf of the Committee for Higher Education and Training, this is the chat, which is an executive board within FENS, I have the pleasure to act as your host today. Um, the idea of these FENS EPA webinars is actually to present hot topics in the field of psychiatry and to always discuss these topics uh, from a clinical as well as a related neuroscientific perspective. And to do this, we uh, want to have always two expert feet, uh, speakers that can actually illuminate from both sides. So today's kickoff topic will be psychedelics, the clinical versus the neuroscientist point of view. And uh, since my own expertise lies in a completely different field in neuroscience, I would like to uh, introduce you to our expert moderator for today, who will further introduce you to the topic and will guide you through the rest of the webinar. As I have the great pleasure to introduce you to Professor, uh, Professor Thomas Panenicek from the National Institute of Mental Health in Prague. Uh, Professor Panenicek is a medical doctor as well as a PhD who has a long-standing international renowned clinical as well as neuroscientific expertise in the field of psych uh, psychedelics research and is therefore a perfect match as a today's moderator. With this, Thomas, I would like to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Derek, and thank you for this opportunity to moderate this first uh, kind of webinar. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure then to uh, share with you a little bit uh, in the uh, introduction for what we are going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about psychedelics and uh, about the clinical versus the neuroscientist's point of view. Uh, just at the beginning, what, psych, uh, what are the conflicts of interest? These are uh, my conflicts of interests. And uh, at the beginning, just let's move towards what psychedelics are. Uh, these are very interesting compounds, which uh, are to many known as hallucinogens that have been explored in the past. And uh, the psychedelic terms is a more uh, new term, which in fact means that they are uh, compounds that are soul manifesting. Uh, there are hundreds of compounds that can induce psychedelic effects. Uh, when we speak closely about psychedelics, we speak about classical serotonergic psychedelics, which are mainly belonging to three groups, uh, chemically related groups, tryptamines, ergolines, and phenylethylamines. And uh, when we look on those closely, uh, there are drugs uh, which are most explored these days and also in the past, which is uh, psilocin, dimethyltryptamine or LSD and mescaline. And if you look at the structure, they are uh, very closely related to serotonin. And, Thomas, uh, do you yes. show slides at this very moment? Because the slides uh, are not on. Sorry, I forgot <laughs> to share. Uh, sorry for this confusion, share screen. Once again, okay. So uh, I go back to the to the first slide uh, to share to see the conflicts of interest uh, once again. So now you see it. Yep. Okay. Uh, so this is about the psychedelics, the 
uh, the term, which is uh, sole manifesting drugs, which I said. And here are the examples of uh, various drugs that can induce psychedelic effects and uh, classical serotonergic psychedelics I've meant, uh, mentioned, like tryptamines, ergolines, and phenylethylamines, uh, which we, which this uh, webinar will be focused mainly. And uh, within these, uh, psilocin, uh, and psilocybin, DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and LSD are the most studied in these days. And when we look on the structure of these drugs, they are very closely related to serotonin, and uh, they are mechanism of action. The main mechanism of action is believed to be related to uh, the agonism at serotonin 2A receptors. When we go a bit to the past, uh, there was a uh, lots of research ongoing till these days, but actually psilocybin, which is probably the most studied compound these days, is not the first one. The first one was mescaline and uh, followed by uh, dissociative anesthetic fencyclidine and followed by the discovery of LSD. And uh, LSD started to be uh, like the, one of probably one of the most investigated drugs in psychiatry at the time, around 50s and 70s of the past century. And why? That's because psychiatry didn't have any uh, drugs to, uh, that we know in these days. This is uh, just to uh, show when the first drugs, uh, first antipsychotics and antidepressants entered psychiatry. Psychiatry. So that was a really uh, important time where psychedelics were explored for their potential therapeutic effects. However, at uh, 1971, uh, the United Nations Psychotropic Conventions uh, mainly politically uh, blocked uh, the research uh, and the use of psychedelics, uh, especially LSD, but also psilocybin, which you can see on the graphs on the left side. And for uh, several uh, decades, there was almost no uh, research. And today we see there's a high uh, dramatic increase in, in the uh, amount of studies, uh, in uh, amount of studies with psychedelics. Uh, when we look on clinical trials gov, uh, there is just, uh, when we put there a word psilocybin, we can see that there are 122 clinical trials which are registered for psilocybin these days. So, uh, we speak a lot about psychedelic renaissance. So uh, what does it mean? Is Are psychedelics going to be a new game changer of psychiatry in these days? And if yes, what are the indications where they can act? Uh, and uh, what is also discussed a lot, is psychedelic effects something which is important or is it a side effect that is unwanted? And uh, whether it is an important thing, what is the uh, relation between brain and the behavioral outcome? And we're also working with drugs which are which are active on uh, brain and they induce uh, robust phenomenology in humans, which are very difficult to uh, which is very difficult to get uh, uh, the uh, from 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 animals the same uh, same description of the feeling. So uh, is the animal research something that can help us uh, to understand the neurobiology of uh, of psychedelic effects and whether these studies are translational? So these are questions that uh, some of those will be answered in the following talks. Uh, each of them will last approximately 15 minutes. The first one will be, uh, will be presented by uh, Professor Guy Goodwin, uh, from, from England, from Oxford University. Uh, Professor uh, Goodwin has a huge history of doing uh, clinical research in psychiatry, especially in bipolar disorder. And he is uh, on the, uh, he's the PI of the first and probably largest uh, clinical trial uh, phase, uh, on, on psilocybin that was, uh, that was uh, uh, done by Compass Pathways, and the following talk will be a uh, following talk that will be performed by Emma Robinson, who is a professor of pharmacology, uh, psychopharmacology at Bristol University, and has a long tradition in uh, preclinical research and also translational research. So uh, that's all from my from my side, and I would like to invite Guy Goodwin to uh, start his presentation, which is uh, entitled Exploring the Use of Psychedelic Experience in Psychiatry. Great. Thanks, Thomas. If you could stop sh screen sharing that. Would be great. great. Thank you. And I will see what I can do here. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. So, um, just a disclaimer, which I'm obliged to make, which is that because I work for Compass Pathways, um, and I'm making statements that are forward-looking, 
Um, I have to refer you from greater detail, if you're interested, to the SEC um, submissions that the company makes, which detail all of the risks and potential problems with the development of this uh, approach to the treatment of patients. So my objectives today um, are to briefly review the psilocybin and the psychedelic experience to describe what it is and how we attempt to measure it. Um, I'm then going to look at the largest trial that Thomas has already referred to um, so far done with psilocybin. And then I'm going to speculate a little bit about what we can and we cannot say about the mechanism action on the basis of what we saw in this trial. So relatively simple, relatively short. The story so far is that the relevant serotonergic drugs, the ones that um, you've already seen, um, bind to a range of receptors, but in particular, we know that the actions of the 5-HT2A receptor seem to be related to the psychedelic experience, which is such a defining characteristic of these drugs. Um, the psychedelic phenomena are experienced as personally meaningful. So they aren't just random hallucinations. They're things that people describe in great detail sometimes as referring to their own personal history, their own experience, their own uh, hopes, fears, and, uh, and understandings. Um, we know that they, there are brain changes, and these brain changes are profound in man, um, and they're blocked by 5-HT2 antagonists. And finally, we know that from a number of studies that there appears to be efficacy in depression, um, and that this efficacy is positive and enduring after a single administration. So that's kind of what we know. Now, the key question, if psilocybin works, is how does it work? And I just want, I'm going to use this, these four possibilities, and I'm going to refer to them several times during the talk. And at the end of it, I want to try and reach tentative conclusions. But there are a number of possible ways in which people talk about psilocybin and how it works. The first is that it's a drug effect that somehow enhances psychotherapy, and that without the psychotherapy, there would be no benefit. Some people very clearly believe and say that. The second possibility is a drug experience that literally changes your mind, that the actual experience on the day enables you to see things, which means you cannot see them the same subsequently, and that that explains why it endures. This is a kind of brainless explanation. It's a mind-based explanation. The second is that it's a drug, the third is, is a drug experience that changes your brain, and that the experience may be a kind of incidental readout or proof of necessary drug action. So this is very much hovering on saying, we don't know whether it's mind or brain, but we think we know it's to do with what happens the, when you take the drug. The final, the final kind of approach is the idea that actually the psychedelic phenomena are non-specific and potentially adverse effects. And what we should be doing is trying to find a non-psychedelic alternative with similar pharmacological properties. Uh, and that the, the psychedelic drugs are simply a clue to some more profound effect on brain chemistry, and in particular um, on um, synaptogenesis. So let's start with the subjective experience, the intensity, the dimensions of the psychedelic experience. It's important to understand that the, the form of the psychedelic experience is pretty stereotyped across different people, even across different cultures. And, even, and particularly in patient groups. And you can score it on a scale, the most common of which is the altered states of consciousness scale. And that gives us five dimensions, which you can see on this spidergram, and then also plotted as individual graphs as a function of dose of psychedelic, in this case, um, psilocybin with a maximum dose of 20 milligrams in this case. And what I hope you can see is that there are five dimensions um, identified here, and they're called rather arbitrarily oceanic boundlessness. We're going to talk a lot about that. There's a positive experience for most people. There's dread of ego dissolution, which is very strongly anxious and which is often viewed quite negatively by people. And then there are three others, which I won't go into great detail. Visionary restructuralization is really the very striking visual effects that people experience under the influence of the drug. And as you can see, if you increase the dose, you increase all five of these dimensions. So it is a 
dose-related drug experience, which is expressed in these important and interesting um, personal experiences. Now, what is, how is this turned into a therapy? Well, basically it is strongly believed on the basis of um, historical use of these drugs in the underground by therapists in the United States. And this has been taken up and used in the more modern studies that there are three important components to the treatment as well as the drug. The first is the preparation, the establishment of a therapeutic alliance, the encouragement of a, a kind of positive and anticipatory expectation that the drug will work in particular ways and that you can use the experience in particular ways. It's very unusual. It's not usually the way we prepare people to take psychotropic, um, or the way we take, for example, other antidepressants. The second is the actual experience on the day, which requires someone to be present to support the patient and make sure bad things don't happen because the patient is in a vulnerable state and accidents can certainly happen if people take the drug on their own. And then finally, the third phase is usually regarded as integration. And this is where the patient comes back and talks about the experience and kind of makes sense of it. Um, that can be regarded by some people as very much uh, something to do with psychotherapy. It can be seen by others as essentially a safety measure. So for example, if people are inspired to you know, give away their house, one might discourage them from doing that and allow the impulse to wear down a bit over the subsequent weeks. So there are various ways in which you can interpret integration, and we're less confident about its full impact than we are on the need for preparation and support on the day. Now, what are the complications of studying that kind of treatment in randomized control trials? Well, the first thing is that you've got to equalize the psychological support. So there needs to be a consistent approach to the sitter role and to the integration so that you don't end up biasing the outcome by having a different psychological approach, depending on what dose of the patients have received or even if they've received placebo. The second is that we seem to need the right kind of setting, that there needs to be a fairly immersive kind of setting. So the light may be a bit dimmed. The us it's usual to offer people eye shades, often music, to encourage a sense of inward journey, if you like. And finally, the safety element seems to depend a lot on the therapeutic alliance, the positive regard that the patient has for the therapist. And all of those things should be equal at the point at which we randomize to different treatments. The second issue is unblinding and expectation. Unlike other drug trials, we have to train people to expect a positive psychedelic experience so that they can cope with it and benefit from it. So unblinding in the context of a psychedelic study is when the psychedelic experience is absent. We normally use the thinking of unblinding as when you distinguish a drug, active drug from placebo on the assumption that normally the drugs we use to treat depression don't have subjective effects. It's the other way around in this particular case. It's the absence of an effect, which is unblinding. And that raises the possibility that you get a nocebo effect. And I talk about that a little bit later. Now, the phase 2B clinical trial that I was involved with, first of all, as the PI, as an independent con me consultant to, to Compass Pathways, uh, and then subsequently as the chief medical officer in the company. So I changed, I switched roles uh, some of the way through, um, recruited 233 patients. Um, it was powered to detect a difference between 25 milligrams and one milligram of five on the Madras scale. Um, it's unusual in that sense in that it was a clearly well-designed pre-registered study. Um, it was conducted in 10 countries, 22 sites. And so it was atypical of many phase two studies conducted by drug companies. Uh, patients were treatment resistant. They had failed at least two and maximum four previous attempts of treatment with an antidepressant. And they were weaned off any current treatment over the course of up to ma a maximum of four weeks to leave a two week minimum period of being patients drug free. So that was the run into the study. Over that time, people had 
two to three sessions of preparation. And they then attended a specialized, their specialized centers for the treatment day on which they were randomized to receive one 10 or 25 milligrams of psilocybin. A single administration and patients were then followed up for 12 weeks. And at the key time points, um, they were assessed for depressive symptoms remotely by a blinded observer, which I think is very important, with the Madras rating scale. And the primary outcome was pre-specified to be at three weeks, and the change in the Madras from day zero to week three was the measure that was of primary interest. Um, what was also important was that we did not recruit many patients with previous psychedelic experience. In fact, over 90% of patients had no reported no previous psychedelic experience. And the other issue, of course, is that this was a large study by the standards of the previous studies done in this field. So there were almost 80 patients in each um, arm of the study. For that reason, it was obviously possible to publish it in a high impact journal when we finally had a full account of the results. And that was in November 2022. And this is the outcome. This plots in blue, the 25 milligram response, in green, the 10, and in one, the one milligram, uh, the gray, the one milligram response. And what you can see is a dose effect relationship, which is very clear at week three, and the superiority of statistically significant at the 0 0.001 level of 25 milligrams compared to one milligram. Um, what is also important to see is that the 10 milligram dose is not particularly effective. And in fact, over the course of the observational period, it largely merged with the one milligram arm of the study. So as well as the result in the primary outcome, you can notice that this is a very fast effect. So it's present literally on the day following the administration of the drug. And that is before any integration takes place. And it's a reasonably well-sustained effect going out to 12 weeks. You can also look at the uh, analysis in terms of responders and remitters. And again, you see a very clear difference between the 25 milligram dose and indeed the 10 and the one milligram. And this is true at day two, at week one, week three. And this is particularly the case for remission. You can see remission at week three in 30% of uh, patients treated with 25 milligrams. And this is a, if you go back to the STAR-D study, which looked systematically at responses to uh, late line treatments uh, in depression, uh, you can see that this is a good rate of response. It was also reasonably well sustained out to 12 weeks. And this shows the numbers of patients showing sustained response defined in two di slightly different ways. Um, one, the more relaxed definition give, obviously gives you slightly higher numbers, but you can clearly see the difference. And in particular, that 10 milligram is different from, uh, from 25 as well as one. Um, on terms of adverse effects, the particular concern in all depression studies is emergent suicidality. And this simply summarizes that there was some emergent suicidality, as you would expect. Uh, patients come into these studies with low suicidality ratings, and there were some patients who showed some worsening. The distribution of change was it, there were slightly higher uh, worsening in the 25 and 10 milligram groups compared to the one milligram. And we don't know whether that is a significant thing that we will have to be concerned about in future, or whether it simply reflected random differences in vulnerability across the three groups, because they were also different at baseline. Uh, final note is that three participants in the 25 milligram group reported a, a serious adverse event of suicidal behavior at week three, there were no suicide attempts and no suicides, but um, because this all occurred in the 25 milligram arm, we will again be very vigilant going forward in looking at this issue in greater detail in larger numbers of patients. So how is the clinical efficacy best understood? As I indicated before, are we enhancing psychotherapy? Are we changing people's mind? Are we changing the brain? Or does it just a drug? Um, this is what we saw in terms of the experience measured with the ASC5D for the 25, 10, and 1 milligram doses with our patients. And you can see 
that there was a, a dose-related difference along all of the dimensions uh, of the scale. When we look at whether there's a correlation between those uh, changes and the effects at uh, three weeks in the madras, we find that there are uh, moderate associations. In this case, you can see for oceanic boundlessness, you can see at all three doses, there's a correlation such that if you have high scores on oceanic boundlessness, you tend to have reduced madras scores at three weeks. In contrast, if you look at the second row, this is anxious ego dissolution, there's no relationship at all. So there is a strong relationship between a positive experience and there is no relationship between a negative experience, which I think is an important specificity, which favors the idea that the experience is really quite important. Because if it was simply drug dose, then there would be no reason to think that the anxious ego dissolution wouldn't correlate just as well as the oceanic boundlessness. And you can see that other dimensions are intermediate or similar. Uh, and in particular, the visual restructuralization and oceanic boundlessness are positively related to good outcomes and the reduction of vigilance, which is a kind of dopiness um, or the ego dissolution are not related or even in the case of anxious ego, negatively related to outcome at three weeks. So this is an interesting finding. If we think about where these measures are made, this shows preparation. A star P, which is our measure of therapeutic alliance, the oceanic boundlessness, which is measured on the day of dosing, and then emotional breakthrough, which is usually estimate, which is estimated the day after when patients come back to describe their experiences. And then of course, the follow-up to the madras at three weeks. This means that we can look at the pathway, the actual path analysis, which looks at how variance distributes between different sequential events along that research timeline, and look at whether there's evidence for one of these factors, in particular, the fidelity and star P therapeutic alliance with the outcome, as would be predicted by a strong hypothesis about psychotherapy. And what this shows you for the 25 milligram dose is that star P, the measure of uh, therapeutic alliance, has a small effect on the actual experience of oceanic boundlessness. So it facilitates, which is kind of what you would hope it would do. And that's a statistically significant effect. The oceanic boundlessness in turn has a much bigger effect on the MADRA score at three weeks. And so that's what we've already seen in terms of the correlation. But in fact, what is interesting is that there's no evidence for a direct path from therapeutic alliance to that MADRA's total score. The therapeutic alliance works entirely through facilitating the uh, psychedelic effect. So if we return to our four questions and see what um, our data say, a drug effect that enhances psychotherapy without the therapist, there would be no bet and the psychotherapy, there would be no benefit. I don't think that is supported by our data. A drug experience that changes your mind or a drug experience that changes your brain could be. Uh, this is the mind-brain problem uh, writ large for psychedelia. And finally, a drug effect that changes your brain and that psychedelic phenomena are nonspecific, potentially adverse effects. I don't think you can contend that if you see specificity for one dimension of the experience versus another. So in conclusion, psilocybin produces a psychedelic experience. In the largest clinical trial so far in treatment-resistant depression, we saw a, a positive effect at three weeks, which was well-maintained out to 12 weeks. And we there have a test case for regulatory approval. And the company has moved now into phase three, and we'll be hoping to submit the final details to the FDA in due course. Finally, the mechanism of the effect doesn't exclude experience as a key factor in the treatment outcome for depression, but I think it leaves open whether we should look at that from the through the prism of a psychological or mind-based effect or a physical and a brain-based effect. And I'm hoping that Emma's gonna convince us which way we should jump when we think about how we develop this approach in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Guy, for a great talk.
Uh, I just would like to uh, say to attendees that there is a question and answer window open, so you can put your questions. The question and answer block will be at the end of uh, after the two sessions, and uh, they will be replied then. So I will depict them and ask uh, ask speakers to to answer them. So uh, thank you, Guy, again. And uh, now I'm welcoming uh, Emma, and she will talk about the neurobiology of psychedelics. Uh, and studies in animals uh, she performed. So go ahead, Emma. Thanks, Thomas. And uh, hopefully everyone can hear me OK and see the slides OK. Um, so I'm going to try and very briefly talk a little bit about the work that's been done in the preclinical space. I, I'm not sure, Guy, whether I'm going to have an answer to your question, but I'm certainly going to tell you what, what I think might be going on and uh, based on some of the work that we've been doing. So um, just with my uh, slides disclosures. So um, really the most relevant to this is that some of the data that I'm going to show you uh, at the end has been done in collaboration um, with uh, Compass Pathways. So this is a rather busy slide, but in the time I've got available, I, I thought I'd just try and condense, you know, lots of the different ideas that are uh, and the different methodologies that are being used in psychedelic research to investigate um, the, the mechanisms from a, a uh, a fundamental point of view, the, the fundamental neurobiology. And this just kind of tries to bring together a whole range of different sort of ideas and methodologies. And I'm sure many of you will be aware that in the in the basic sciences in, in neuroscience, we've got a whole range of really exciting technologies and, and methodologies that are enabling us to, to dive in from the, the sort of the molecular. So looking at how these drugs interact with um, target receptors. And we've heard about the 5-HT2A receptor and, and here we can use these really clever molecular modeling approaches to, to see where the drug binds and, and how it affects the protein. Um, and one of the areas that's also been mentioned is this idea of, of um, acting at the cellular level to have these psycho, uh, psychoplastogens, so uh, increasing plasticity in the brain. And, and this has been particularly exciting as a, an area which might help to explain these enduring changes. As, as somebody who's worked in pharmacology, I'm so used to a drug having an effect and then the drug's metabolized and the effect wears off. So how is it that these drugs are having these very uh, sustained effects? And then at the other end, we have to think about the behavioral outcomes. And in animals, it's really difficult to model many of the things that we look at in patients. And so we rely on, on um, these sort of behavioral assays. And in psychedelic research, that's, that's really been dominated by looking at the kind of idea that hallucinations can be reflected in the head twitch response in mice. Um, or rats, or looking at behavioral despair as a, a measure of depression related behaviors. And in using these behavioral approaches, we can zoom in and sort of look at what's happening at a cellular level. And we can start to look at how these different, I've just highlighted three psychedelics here and the receptors that they bind to, and, and what we think might be these downstream signaling pathways that link into their efficacy. And that's really because what we can do in animal models is we can, we can manipulate these either genetic or using inhibitors, we can target these different pathways and we can look at how they impact on these behavioral outcomes. Um, as well as looking at things like these plasticity changes that you can measure and see uh, in the brain. And so just really quickly, I mean, there's a, there's a huge literature and I can't possibly do it justice in, in the time available, but just some of the kind of key ideas that are arising from the preclinical field. So we're pretty confident that the hallucinogenic effect, uh, which we can see as this head twitch response in rodents, is aligned with their, their efficacy and their, their uh, actions at the 5-HT2A receptor. So that aligns quite well with the clinical work. We know that these psychedelic compounds certainly do promote these cortical structural and, and functional neuroplasticity. And, and that can again be linked to the 2A receptor where blocking the 2A receptor uh, causes, prevents these uh, effects from happening. But then we also have some rather interesting sort of novel ideas arising. So there's some evidence that non-hallucinogenic 5-HD2A agonists, so drugs which we know they don't have this head twitch response effect, but they can promote plasticity. And, and in some of the animals, 
animal models, they suggest that they may be antidepressant. And again, also in, in the full swim test, this, this way of potentially looking at uh, depression related behaviors, there's some evidence that uh, it may well be independent of the 2A receptor. And that poses this possibility that perhaps there is a difference between the sort of uh, classic psychedelic effects and then perhaps some other aspect of the pharmacology of, of these drugs. And these are just some, uh, a few examples of papers, recent papers in this area. But one of the real challenges, and this is something that I've been interested in for more than a decade, has been that data from the foursome test are really not consistent. And also there's been a lot of concern as to what this means relative to what we measure in patients and whether it's a translational readout. And similarly, this reliance on the head twi twitch response and the foursome, they, they do risk uh, poor translational validity. Um, and so we think when we think about how we model in animals, of course, you know, we, we do face a really difficult challenge. So this is how we sort of subjectively think about rating depression in people. So using these kind of rating scales or as, as Guy showed, these very subjective, very human ways of um, talking about the psychedelic experience. And then in animals, when we want to study depression, we look at things like their interest in solutions, sweet solutions, behavioral despair or, or anxiety-like behavior. And the problem is that, that, that these are not the same and, and that always poses a challenge. And it, we don't know, it may be that the, the mechanisms that we're looking at that definitely mediate these behaviors are relevant to what happens in the clinic, but equally because they're not translational, it's very hard for us to say for sure that that is the case. And that that's where we sort of come up against a bit of an issue. And this has been a long standing problem. It's not just in the psychedelic field, but in the conventional antidepressants as well. And that's where my work started. Um, and I was really interested in could we look at this a different way? And so we zoomed in on this idea of effective biases in major depressive disorder. And, and for those who are not familiar, this really is a, a long standing uh, idea that goes back to the 60s when um, Beck talked about this idea of negative schema and how these may drive and, and, and perpetuate depression um, and we know that um, these negative bias affect our cognition and, and that gives us a, a way in which we can potentially quantify them in an objective way and, and the exciting thing for us is that that's also translational we can potentially look at these in non-human species as well as uh, in humans and, and pick up this uh, perhaps a sort of cognitive biomarker we know that negative biases seem to be uh, an important substrate underpinning the de development of this pessimistic world view that conventional antidepressants seem to positively bias new experiences and um, and they require learning and memory to, to change mood and this is why they're delayed and it's a rather nice and I think very relevant to this session we're talking about the antidepressant having a biological effect and then experience dependent factors then feeding into this so social interactions rewarding activities and it's the combination that then impacts on the clinic benefit um, and we know from our animal models that we can replicate this work um, that's been done in humans and so this then led us on to this idea that perhaps rapid acting antidepressants and 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 we were started working on, on ketamine but more recently with uh, psilocybin perhaps they arise because they can modulate some sort of affective bias circuit and that that changes the way that past experiences are perceived and perhaps even that they could facilitate relearning uh, with a more positive effective valence and this comes from you know observations in how patients report their psychedelic experience and how they report feeling about experiences from their past that are perhaps negative that they now feel differently about. So we took this idea and we've basically made an animal model very simply by assuming that if you learn something in two independent experiences under neutral states, then those will be equally valued to you. But you can change that relative value, you can generate an effective bias by causing a negative state for one experience or a positive state for one of those experiences. And we can quantify that bias. And we've, we've shown that. And if anyone's interested, I'm more than happy to talk more about that. And so we developed this effective bias test. It's a simple bowl digging approach in, in rodents. They, they learn it very easily. We have equal value rewards. And by giving a negative experience during one of the learning experiences or a positive, we can then quantify an effective bias at the end. And one of the really useful things about this model, and I'm, I'm going to talk about not just how drugs like psychedelics might modulate our experiences going forward, but also we were particularly interested in this idea that perhaps if we gave the drug here before we asked the animal to retrieve the memory, could we change the way that they perceive that uh, memory?
And so that's essentially what I'm showing you here. This is a series of data that, that we've obtained working with uh, psilocybin. And we've been able to show that psilocybin is actually interacting with these effective biases at, at clinically relevant doses. But it actually is rather, seems to be rather clever. It seems to be that, that psilocybin is affecting uh, these uh, biases in a number of ways. So in this first graph here, what you're looking at is what happens when we give animals a negative effective bias. So this is a control group. They have a negatively biased memory. And when we pre-treat them with uh, psilocybin or ketamine before they go into that preference test, before they're asked to retrieve the memory, we can change that bias. So these animals lose that negative bias and they, uh, they then go to neutral. So this is about an hour after a treatment, so when they would still be under the sort of psychedelic uh, influence. And we know this is really very selective because we have a control memory uh, task that, that doesn't show this, so this looks to be a rather selective effect. What we were surprisedly surprised, but certainly very excited to see, was that actually if we take those, um, that same protocol but we test the animals 24 hours later, we actually see some sort of relearning effect has happened. So a negatively biased memory is actually inverted to a positive affective bias. So this suggests that, that in some way this affective bias circuit has been modulated and that modulation is sustained and we would hypothesize that may well be linked into these plasticity effects. And that enables the animal to reactivate a memory and to then relearn the affective bias, but under this modified affective state or modification of this affective bias circuit, that can then invert to the positive, which is really exciting. And interestingly, two very different pharmacological targets, ketamine and psilocybin, show this similar effect. But where we see these drugs differ and, and potentially this may be, we can hypothesize perhaps it links into the even longer term effects with psilocybin, is that if we then look at animals' ability to, so, so we do the, uh, the, the, we look at biases to new associative memories, the psilocybin effect is, is sustained. And so we induce these positive biases uh, to new experiences, which is very similar to what we see with venlafaxine, but different from ketamine. So this is where, where there is a difference. And interestingly, we talked you talked about the, the sort of level of, of experience and, and the positive and the negative. And we can see that actually up to 0.3, these animals are showing this nice positive bias, but actually at one mg per cook, when we get into the higher doses, perhaps this is becoming a bit more aversive because we don't see that effect. In fact, we see a negative uh, bias. And so just to sort of summarize that very kind of brief uh, overview, what, what do we know? So um, we know that psychedelics affect serotonin receptors in the brain, and we know that that does definitely lead to long-term plasticity changes. Um, and that seems to be linked to emotional circuits and behavior. But of course, the issue with conventional depression models is that they do have limitations in translation. Whereas I think effective biases provide us with this trans-species sort of cognitive bias a uh, cognitive biomarker of effective state. And, and using that approach, we can see that, that clinically relevant doses of both psilocybin and ketamine are able to selectively attenuate negative biases. So they, they, this may account for why they have a rapid antidepressant effect. Conventional antidepressants don't do this. Psilocybin and ketamine also seem to facilitate this experience-dependent relearning. And we have some additional data that shows that depending on how we reactivate the cues during that window, we can actually change how that relearning happens. So potentially showing that there is a relationship between what the drug is doing at a biological level and these experience-dependent factors. And perhaps psilocybin has a, a, an added uh, mechanism where it can positively bias these new experiences similar to conventional antidepressants. And that prolongs the antidepressant effects. And perhaps this is why clinically we see their effects uh, lasting for so much longer. Uh, so sort of conclusions are rather sort of speculative conclusions at this stage. We know that psychedelics can induce these long-term plasticity changes in, in, in regions of the brain that we link to emotional circuits um, and that we can quantify uh, arising neuropsychological effects uh, in a non-human species, so potentially giving us a route to really uh, starting to explore more deeply these um, underlying mechanisms. And I think we're beginning to feel some confidence that, that modulation of effective biases is a potential therapeutic mechanism. So 
we can link the neuroplasticity changes that are occurring at this molecular level because we can see that the, the circuit is being, uh, is being changed by the drugs after a single dose and that this, these effects are sustained through changes in plasticity. And that that then renders the, the animal certainly in a, in a state where we can then use experience dependent um, manipulations to lead to these uh, behavioral effects. Uh, and so potentially linking to the, 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 the work that we've seen in, in the clinic. And so I'll just finish there by acknowledging the people whose data I've shown um, and the collaboration um, that we've had to work with this and, of course, the subjects that we have the pleasure of working with. So thank you. Thank you, Emma, as well, for a great, great talk. And uh, when I see the questions and answers, there are already some questions appeared and there's one raised hand. So uh, I might, uh, I would like to start the question and answer session. I would like to say to all attendees that they still can post questions. And uh, this is from Michael, uh, other, from Michael Hygen. And the question is, how does COMPASS plan on approaching efficacy measures in phase three trials for participants that may require risky tranquilizing medication, e.g. benzodiazepine or atypical antipsychotic during a COMPASS 360 dosing session as occurred in the phase two B trial? Might you use two estimates to account for the intercurrent events differently? We didn't, we didn't have very much use of um sedatives actually um in the in the phase two trial and we've got no really we see no need to encourage that um obviously if it's necessary it's there as a safety uh, rescue procedure um i don't expect it to be a significantly large factor in us having to take account of it in um in the estimate that we use um but in fact you know the the basic issue with um, the use of psychedelics is a single administration and then you follow the patients up. Um, so it's actually quite unlike many other drugs which require repeated administrations and so interactions with other drugs become quite an issue and that obviously isn't so much of an issue with our designs and we follow all the patients. They don't drop out of the studies if they receive adjunctive medication. So we get a very clear and comprehensive long-term follow-up of how patients do certainly in the phase two, up to 12 weeks, and in the phase three, it will be up to one year. Okay, thank you. I might uh, ask you a question, Guy, directly also related to the uh, to the session itself. Uh, in some subjects who are going to a psychedelic session, there could be quite a lot of anxiety or so-called challenging experience. Uh, there are there is an evidence that the anxiety could be related to non-response in, in in depressed people. But uh, what is your opinion on that? There was just one small trial published on that, and uh, challenging experience by therapists could be also uh, also reported as to be very important. And we can also speak about peak experience or mystical experience, which is probably leading the response. So, what is your opinion on these challenging experience? Well, our, our correlations are simply with what we measured with the ASC 5D. So um, if, we, if we're trying to pick out something very specific and very personal, we're not going to be able to do that. Um, but what we could, we could say is that uh, the anxiety component, the, the, the ego dread component, is negatively predictive of outcomes. So it's not a good thing. Um, by contrast, um, oceanic boundlessness, which is very basically correlates with mystical experience, um, is what is correlated with good outcomes. Uh, that and emotional breakthroughs on the day, which are, have also been described by the Imperial Group originally. So we think there are very clear positive associations and they are with these, what are traditionally regarded as the best aspects of the psychedelic experience. And we see that at scale. So, you know, that is that has to be explained. Uh, if you're going to dismiss the psychedelic experience, you've got to explain why. The correlation is there and is specific. It isn't just related to dose or peak of anything. Okay, great. Thank you. There's one more question for you, and then I will switch some questions for, for Emma as well. Uh, Philip Gorwood asks, needing the presence of a supervisor for eight hours when providing psilocybin is challenging, difficult for treatment setting, stressful for patients. Any way to avoid that? Um, not in phase three, Philip, <laughs> um, because, you know, the, this is an experiment and it's got to have a certain guardrail. 
Um, I think this is the challenge for implementation, which we're, we're starting to look at, and we will look at in more detail with providers, first of all, in the United States. Um, I mean, one of the ways around it is clearly for patients to receive, or several patients to be treated at once, and to have surveillance, which is a terrible word, but is probably necessary, uh, using closed circuit TV for the individual treatment rooms. And that has been done at the Kadima uh, Center in, um, in San Diego, in a study which we, we're just submitting uh, for final review uh, to neuropsychopharmacology. Uh, and that will describe, uh, that describes patients who, who were actually administered as in groups. So we think that that would prove to be feasible and there's experience in cancer patients who have actually been prepared as a group and then, then had the drug administered as a group. So there's going to be, I think, a lot of scope for innovation. But the first step is obviously to convince the regulators that there is a, a true treatment effect, that it's not all smoke and mirrors, that we deserve to be recognized as a medicine. And then we will put this drug into the hands of responsible clinicians who will work out how best to use it in due course. I think that's the way to think about it. Okay. Great. I see before we switch to the Q&As to Emma, uh, there is a raised hand of Francesca Taglia, Taglia Carne. So uh, can you can you ask your question? Hi. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me fine? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just for my technology, I can't post in the question section. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but I was wondering... Um, so uh, for the week three suicidal thoughts that um, have uh, raised over the study, um, how does this relate to the drug effect weaning off and or to the drug availability outside the, clinic, the clinical trial setting? Um, and another question around this is for the suicidal thoughts, are we starting from a baseline point of view that all the patients enrolled had a positive expectation of the effect of the drug, or that relates as well to the expect on the expectation of the patients at a baseline. Thank you. Okay, uh, that, there's a few. That, that's quite a complicated question. So, just to say, all patients in the trial expect a psychedelic experience. We have to prepare them to expect a psychedelic experience, and obviously, some don't. There's a range of actual experience. Okay, so it's very variable, and you also have to lead them to expect that. Um, we can't really relate expectation to the outcomes. We didn't measure that. We didn't anticipate doing that. So we didn't do it. We will do it in phase three. Um, the issue of suicidality, I think, is an issue for all depression trials. So it's by no means unique to us. Um, all depression trials recruit people who are not actively suicidal because basically ethics committees want you to do that. So they come in with low scores on suicidality items. The items are measured at every visit. And there is a sense in which the only way is up for a certain number of people. Um, we saw small differences in the numbers of people showing small increases, but these are very sub-threshold, okay? We're looking at this in a little more detail to look at the time course. I can't give you the exact time course for the patients who did show increases, but all I can say is that the changes are really very, very small and they occur within a rating scale called the Columbia um, Suicide Severity Rating Scale, which is really designed to detect very threshold effects. It, it is not capturing clinical events uh, in the normal sense of the word, even though they're described as events. So we're very, very cautious about this. We recognize that maybe disappointment can play into this if people were expecting a great response and they don't get one. This could be a result of resulting great disappointment. We're on the lookout for that. All we can say is that the changes were modest. They were a little bit more in the, the two active treated groups. And we have to be, that has to be something we keep an eye on. And clearly it's something that we will incorporate into the eventual protocols for treating patients, particularly the so-called REMS, um, the, the risk mitigation uh, program that will probably be part of the approval if that, if and when that occurs. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. It was really clear. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank okay. you. So uh, thank you as well. And let's move to a question for Emma. Uh, this is Tobias Bast asking, uh, Emma, are your affective bias data that you showed from RETS 
that's the first question. And are the doses of psilocybin that if you use 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and 1 milligram per kilogram causing hat twitches or other cross behavioral changes that can be seen by a visual inspection? Yeah, sure. So yeah, the data are all the all the data we've shown are from rats. So we don't see anything at 0 0.1 mg per kg. Um, the animals look completely normal, no head twitch. We did record all that. See so a very small increase in wet dog shakes at 0.3, and then at, at, point, at the one mg per kg, we do see more behavioral effects, and there are slight increase in emissions. The animals will still perform the task. So these are all all, all acute, but certainly um, it's the highest dose where we see uh, overt changes in behavior, but actually the peak. Uh, effect for us is at 0.3 mg per kg, which is um, where there is a, 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 a correlate of a psychedelic experience, but it's not at the uh, at the higher end. Okay, great. Uh, there's another question from Tadeusz Hubbard uh, from Perea. Uh, could you speak a bit uh, to a possibility of psychedelic opening critical periods? I mean, yeah, it's a really interesting kind of area. And I, I mean, I we haven't specifically looked at this as yet, um, but certainly there is data around. Um, you'll probably be familiar with the idea about the kind of social window and um, using psychedelics to reopen that kind of social development. I think it's a really interesting thought that perhaps, you know, uh, through our period of maturing the brain, uh, the, the emotional circuit, perhaps it's linked to this effect of bias circuit that we think is being modulated. Um, and, you know, whether that's a critical window or whether it's, it's, it's a plasticity effect within that circuit, I'd certainly like to think perhaps there is something going on. I think the thing that we've been surprised about is how specific the effects are. So at the doses that are modulating these biases, these are doses that you just would barely know the animals have had. You know, they, they perform other behavioral tasks completely unaffected. So it does look like, you know, there's relative specificity um, and long term. So, so something is happening where it's not just the acute effects of the drugs, but there is this sustained probably uh, you would expect it to be plasticity driven for it to there be there so much later but yeah lots and lots of things to explore on that though but great it's a great idea yeah great As one more for you uh in fact there are two questions which are pretty similar but i would just uh say the one uh if you could speculate on the anatomical identity of a circuit that mediates positive biases and also why would the circuit be specifically modulated by uh psychedelics could it be a different distribution of certain two receptors yeah i mean this is this is what we're trying to do at the moment so we got some pretty in so certainly we know prefrontal cortex so you can put the drug directly into prefrontal cortex and fully replicate all the systemic findings so certainly looks like prefrontal is really really important um we think also the amygdala is important and so we're beginning to see it as a potentially a circuit possibly ventral ventral hippocampus to prefrontal and then to the amygdala would be where i'd be kind of you know, thinking certainly prefrontal amygdala looks very important. Um, we've got some electrophysiology data looking at different subpopulations. I think the challenge for us is going to be that this is, it looks like it's a very small population of neurons, and then we've got to find them, and then we've got to work out how it's working. I think the unique pharmacology, the fact that you've got ketamine and psilocybin acting similarly, um, and at low doses that don't hit the whole brain gives us a potential route into looking at this network. Um, uh, my speculative thought is that I think it is down to neuronal, so the populations of receptors, they're doing something in the brain naturally, and it happens that they also are targeted by low dose NMDA uh, antagonists like ketamine, and potentially they express, you know, receptors of the 5-HT family that are, are hit by um, uh, the psychedelics. Um, we've got some early data to suggest that within prefrontal cortex, you've got multiple populations and they respond differently to these drugs. So some are being activated whilst others are being inhibited. So that certainly would point towards receptor distribution within a circuit could, could be how you're getting this kind of specificity. Um, but Certainly, I think there's some exciting studies to come on that one. Great, great, thank you. So we are almost uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, I can ask one more question to each of the speakers because we started uh, slightly later. If uh, Guy, if you agree, there's a nice uh, question uh, which is more to the 
uh, to the clinical uh, clinic clinicians than than scientists uh, from Parinas. Vahdat, uh, can psychedelics push a patient to psychotic experiences? Something about the safety of psilocybin treatment. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, they that they can, and certainly the experiences that people have and the way they evaluate them, um, you know, re means that there's always going to need to be caution. And as you probably know, we restrict access in clinical trials to people who don't have a history of psychosis or even a family personal first degree relative history of psychosis. So I think we need to go very cautiously on that, but I think individual differences in vulnerability will be quite important to that. And that, that's one of the reasons why wide access is something I think we're gonna to have to be cautious about. Great, thank you. And one last for Emma uh, from Agostina Saxon. Uh, have you performed any controls of memory tasks without an emotional component just to try to dissect the effect on uh, in the cognitive component of a memory from the emotional one? Yeah, so in the interest of time, I didn't, I didn't show the data, but we actually got a really neat, we think, control assay. So, so what we do is it's almost the same. So the animals are learning two different things on two different days, and then we give them a preference test. But in this, we don't change their effective state. So there's no emotional component. Effective state's the same throughout the whole protocol, but we give them a two reward pellet learning experience and a one. And so, so they should bias towards the, the two pellet. And that's what control animals do. And interestingly, those doses of drugs that are having these effects on effective biases have no effect in that assay. So this is where we're beginning to really feel we've got this selectivity of effect. Um, so, so the control assay is as close as we could get it to the effective bias test, but without that emotional component. So it looks like the emotional circuits are particularly sensitive. And in fact, we would argue, and we've speculated that the reason that higher doses of drugs, particularly the NMDA side of this, are not effective is because they're then not enabling the rest of the brain to function normally. You've got this disruption in the wider networks and that this, this kind of relearning effect can't happen if you've got, for example, the NMDA receptors blocked. So very speculative, but I, you know, that we have some data to support that actually uh, uh, with ketamine. So I think there is a selective, potentially, pharmacology has given us a route to selectively targeting these emotional circuits. Okay, great. So uh, once again, Thanks to uh, both speakers uh, with great talks and for great uh, interactions with uh, with attendees. Uh, as uh, organizers mentioned, uh, the unanswered questions will be uh, replied by speakers uh, via email. So you will receive uh, all uh, unanswered questions in this in this way. And uh, I would like to thank all attendees for participation. I hope you enjoyed it the same way as I did. And I would give a last word to Dirk, uh, who could finalize or terminate the, the whole webinar. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so yeah, this is in principle then up to me to, to close up this session. So also from, from my side, a big thanks to all the speakers and Thomas for, for playing the excellent moderator today. And uh, we will announce then also the upcoming webinars in time. Uh, also then tactically possibly a bit improved. So there was a request for having subtitles enabled, but uh, for this round, it didn't work out anymore. So we'll definitely take care of that for the next rounds. So with that, thanks to all of you. Have a very nice evening, morning or afternoon, wherever you are and uh, see you back at another time. Bye.